If you enjoyed this content, be sure to like and subscribe. Are you aware that when you deposit money into a checking or savings account, that money no longer belongs to you? Technically and legally, it becomes the property of the bank, and the bank just issues you what amounts to an IOU. The bank classifies your deposits into their bank as an unsecured debt. Most people know that the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, will guarantee deposits up to $250,000. But did you know that since 2010, the FDIC has been given additional powers and responsibilities that prioritize bank interests over personal depositors during a bank insolvency liquidation process? Prior to 1999, this kind of situation couldn't even exist. The Glass-Steagall Act separated investment banking from commercial banking, but was repealed by Congress and President Clinton in 1999 under pressure from Wall Street speculators who felt they needed access to Main Street's commercial bank deposits to bolster the markets. Basically, the repeal of this act allowed banks to be able to use depositors' money for their own investments. The result of the loss of this protection of depositors' funds was the Wall Street financial collapse of 2007-2008 that required hundreds of billions of taxpayer dollars to bail out the country's largest banks. Without the Glass-Steagall Act in place, legislation such as the 2005 Bankruptcy Reform Act was allowed to be enacted which creates super-priority status for banks holding derivatives contracts. This means that when a financial institution is close to bankruptcy, any other bank or financial institution holding derivatives claims against it are given preference over all other creditors and customers for the remaining assets of the failing bank. Following the 2007-2008 worldwide financial collapse, the G20 nations at their 2009 London summit formalized a new organization called the Financial Stability Board, or FSB. The G20 nations agreed to be regulated by the newly formed FSB, which is a subcommittee of the relatively unknown Bank of International Settlements, or BIS. We need to remember that the Bank for International Settlements was established during the Hague Treaty in 1930 by bankers and diplomats of Europe and the United States to collect and disperse Germany's World War I reparation payments. The Bank of International Settlements has since become the central bank for central bankers and is the most powerful financial organization in the world. It no longer functions for the purpose for which it was created over 80 years ago. It's composed of unelected country representatives, it's not accountable to any government or financial institution, and is immune from taxation. In April of 2009, as a result of the 2007-8 global financial crisis, this Bank of International Settlements now has the power to regulate the banks of the top 19 national economies and the European Union. Then along came the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010. Its purpose, in part, was to avoid any future taxpayer-funded bailouts and to provide protection to the shareholders, creditors, and management of those institutions. It also empowers the FDIC to carry out the orderly liquidation of large, complex financial companies with the ability to confiscate customers' deposits. If the bank holding your accounts becomes insolvent, the FDIC has the authority to take your deposits and savings and convert it into stock shares of the bank. You have no say in this matter because in legal terms, as a bank depositor, you are just an unsecured creditor of the bank. 
Both the Bankruptcy Reform Act of 2005 and the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010 provide special protections for derivative defaults, giving them the legal right to demand collateral to cover losses in the event of insolvency. So what does this mean to you? You will have to stand in line behind trillions of dollars of derivative payouts before your checking or savings accounts will be made available to you. So what exactly are these derivatives that have priority over our savings and checking deposits? A derivative is a legal bet or contract that derives its value from another asset, such as a future or current value of oil, government bonds, or anything else. Here's an example. A derivative buys you the option, but not the obligation, to buy oil in six months for today's price or, or any agreed price, hoping that oil will cost more in the future. Derivatives can also be used as insurance, betting that a loan will or won't default before a given date. So it's a big betting system like a casino. But instead of betting on cards and roulette, you're betting on future values and performance of practically anything that holds value. The system is not regulated whatsoever, and you can even buy a derivative on an existing derivative. Most large banks try to prevent smaller investors from gaining access to the derivative markets on the basis of there being too much risk. There is literally no economist in the world that knows exactly how the derivative money flows or how the system works. Derivatives are traded in microseconds by computers, and when the global financial crisis occurs, the results will be catastrophic for the world financial system since the nine largest banks hold a total of $228.72 trillion in derivatives, approximately three times the entire world economy. No government in the world has the money for this bailout. Let's take a closer look at the nine largest banks that holds the majority of the world's derivatives contracts. Number 9. Bank of New York Mellon The Bank of New York has a derivative exposure of $1.375 trillion and is considered a too-big-to-fail bank. Number 8. State Street Financial State Street has a derivative exposure of $1.390 trillion and is also considered a too-big-to-fail bank. Number 7. Morgan Stanley Morgan Stanley is another too-big-to-fail bank that has a derivative exposure of $1.722 trillion. The bank also got a secret $2.041 trillion bailout from the Federal Reserve during the crisis, and this is beyond the taxpayer bailout. Number 6. Wells Fargo Wells Fargo has a derivative exposure of $3.332 trillion. Wells Fargo was just slapped with an $85 million fine by the Federal Reserve for putting good credit borrowers into bad credit rating or high rate loans. In March 2010, Wachovia, owned by Wells Fargo, paid a $110 million fine for allowing transactions connected to drug smuggling and a $50 million fine for failing to monitor cash used to ship 22 tons of cocaine. It also failed to monitor $378.4 billion worth of transactions to Mexican Casas de Cambio, which is kind of like a Western Union that sends anonymous cash transfers, usually linked to drug cartels. Beyond that, Wells Fargo lets its VIP employees live in foreclosed mansions. Wells Fargo Wachovia also got a secret $159 billion bailout from the Federal Reserve. Wells Fargo paid no taxes in 2008 through 2010 and had a tax rate of negative 1.4% 
while making $49 billion in profit during that same time. Number 5. HSBC HSBC has a derivative exposure of $4.321 trillion. HSBC is a Hong Kong-based bank, and its original name is the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation Limited. You will find HSBC working a lot with JP Morgan. Both HSBC and JP Morgan Chase have strong interest in gold and precious metals. HSBC has been sued for allegedly funneling more than $8.9 billion into the largest Ponzi scheme in history, the Bernie Madoff's investment business. HSBC, along with J.P. Morgan Chase, has been sued for allegedly conspiring to suppress the price of silver and gold, partially through precious metal derivatives and making billions of dollars in the process. Number 4. Goldman Sachs Goldman Sachs, definitely designated as a too-big-to-fail bank, has a derivative exposure of $44.192 trillion. Goldman Sachs has advantages over other banks because it has numerous connections with the U.S. government. A lot of former Goldman Sachs employees hold high-level U.S. government positions. The ex-CEO of Goldman Sachs, Hank Paulson, became the Secretary of the Treasury under Bush and during the 2008 financial crisis authored the TARP bill demanding $700 billion in bailout money. In the UK, Goldman Sachs escaped a £10 million bill on a failed tax avoidance scheme with help from good connections. The bank was fined $22 million for sharing valuable non-public information with top clients. Goldman Sachs got an $814 billion secret bailout from the Federal Reserve during the 2008 crisis. Goldman Sachs got $10 billion of the 2008 TARP bailout and, in the same year, paid $10.9 billion in employee compensation and benefits while paying a tax rate of 1%. Number 3. Bank of America Bank of America is a too-big-to-fail bank that has a derivative exposure of $50.135 trillion. Bank of America paid $22 million in settlement charges for improperly foreclosing on active duty troops. Bank of America also received a secret $1.344 trillion bailout from the Federal Reserve. Number 2. Citibank Citibank has a derivative exposure of $52.102 trillion. Citigroup took $45 billion in bailout money. Citigroup also received a secret $2.513 trillion bailout from the Federal Reserve. And finally, number one, J.P. Morgan Chase. J.P. Morgan Chase has a derivative exposure of $70.151 trillion. $70 trillion is roughly the size of the entire world's economy. J.P. Morgan is rumored to hold 50 to 80 percent of the copper market, manipulating it by making massive purchases. J.P. Morgan is also guilty of manipulating the silver market to make billions of dollars. Aluminum prices are manipulated by J.P. Morgan through large physical ownership of material and creating bottlenecks during transport. J.P. Morgan was among the banks involved in the seizure of $620 million in assets for alleged fraud linked to derivatives. J.P. Morgan got a $25 billion taxpayer bailout. J.P. Morgan Chase also received a secret $391 billion bailout from the Federal Reserve. In 2012, J.P. Morgan took a $2 billion loss on its poorly executed derivative bets. I can only hope that this helps to illustrate just how serious these derivative assets are to the world's economy. During a global financial crisis, 
If any of these banks become insolvent, all of these derivatives by law must be paid out first before a single dime is dispersed to a savings or checking deposit. In 2012, the FDIC met with the Bank of England in a joint conference to hash out the framework for a bail-in procedures should not only the banks go insolvent, but also there should be a sovereign debt default in the wake of a financial collapse. And perhaps most importantly, for the common man and individual, the FDIC now has the power to write down your account without ever having to compensate you through promised insurance as they were required by law prior to this conference and the passage of the Dodd-Frank Act. Did you know that U.S. banks are not legally required to give you cash whenever you request a withdrawal? In other words, you may walk into your bank one day and instead of getting cash for a withdrawal request, you will receive a stock certificate and it will be your responsibility to convert it to cash. This legal seizure of your money will most likely happen in just one night in the process called overnight sweeps. The function of the FDIC has evolved from an insurance for depositors to prevent bank runs during an economic crisis into the new process and instrument to prevent institutions from failing without the use of taxpayer bailout money. With the systemic risk exception provisions incorporated into the FDIC Improvement Act of 1991 and the Bankruptcy Reform Act of 2005, which provides special protections to derivative counterparties, giving them the legal right to demand collateral to cover losses in the event of insolvency, meaning derivative counterparties get paid first. The FDIC has the power to seize control of insolvent banks. In most cases, the daily operations of the bank aren't affected because the FDIC quickly brokers a deal to have another solvent institution assume control of the failed bank's deposits and loans. If a buyer can't be found, the FDIC sells the failed bank's assets and uses some of that cash to cover losses suffered by depositors. The FDIC also repays depositors with cash held in its insurance fund. This fund is replenished with premium payments from solvent banks. No depositor has ever lost a penny from FDIC insured cash, but the FDIC offers no precise timeline for insurance payouts in the event of a bank failure. We all need to understand the magnitude of the next financial crisis and how it will be overwhelming, especially to the FDIC. From 2008 to 2013, almost 500 banks failed at a cost of $73 billion. And that's with the government providing trillions of dollars to bail out the banking industry. During the next crisis, the only assets the bankers will have to survive are your deposits and will dry up very quickly as it did in 2008. When the big banks go under, so will all unsecured assets they hold, and there won't be anything that can be done about it. You will be issued bank stock shares for your deposits and investments that will be absolutely worthless. All your money will go to pay back the other bank derivative investments because the banking system set it up that way. So given the magnitude of the crisis to come, Understand that the $250,000 FDIC depositor's insurance is not a guarantee you will get cash, but more likely bank shares of stock in a newly formed and named bank. And since your account has been converted to equity stock for cash, the FDIC is no longer responsible for the deposits because the FDIC only insures cash accounts, not equity accounts. Be prepared because even if the bank does survive, the liquidation process could take months or even years. So what can you do? First, stay away from big banks and their affiliated branches that hold these trillions of dollars of derivatives. 
Did you know that these four largest U.S. banks hold 93% of the total derivative contracts in the United States? If you have accounts with any of these banks, and if one of these banks fail, you can forget ever seeing any of your unsecured deposits being returned to you. Consider transferring your wealth to a well-established credit union or community bank. The credit unions are like banks, but invest all of their profits to give members lower rates and better service. They don't have shareholders to worry about or have derivatives to purchase and sell. And they don't fall under the liquidation preview of the FDIC. Also, you can take any excess wealth and pay off any debt you may have. You don't want to be in any kind of substantial debt when the crisis occurs. Once you are debt free, look at converting your wealth into the physical possession of precious metals or cryptocurrencies kept in a cold storage hardware offline wallet. Also, keep plenty of cash at home. Once they call a bank holiday to prevent a run on the banks, the ATMs will be shut down. You will no longer have access to safety deposit boxes or bank tellers and credit cards will be denied at purchase counters. You will need cash for the initial days or even possibly weeks before the banks open again. And when they do open, be prepared for limited withdrawal amounts and frequencies. Did you find any of this information useful? Do you really believe that the FDIC will be able to insure all deposits up to $250,000 with cash? Are you currently banking with any of these big four? If so, will you stay with them? Let me know in the comments section below. A big thank you to all who support this channel with your likes and comments. I don't monetize my channel, so your support is greatly appreciated. If you're not yet a subscriber, hit the subscribe button. Then select the notification bell to be notified as soon as I post up new content. And as always, feel free to share this content with all.